here for almost 14 years, and when my wife and I moved here, we had an eight-year-old and two five-year-olds. We now have a 22-year-old and two almost 19-year-olds, and the 22-year-old got married yesterday. And so Tiffany's singing that song that God is still who he is, you know, to get him to 22 seemed like he wasn't going to survive about seven years in there. And, and if I had known that yesterday was going to happen, I would have journeyed those seven years a hundred times to get to yesterday. That's only possible because God is always who he is. But it's also a good reminder that that's why we're called to have faith and not knowledge. See, if I knew that it would end up that way, it wouldn't be faith in God I was relying on. It would be my knowledge that I was just going to end up in that spot. But when I have faith, I know, but I don't know. I know who does know. Now, when I say we're not called to have knowledge, I don't mean we're called to be stupid. <laughs> I just mean that sometimes we think if we just knew more, we'd have life under a lock. We'd have it all under wraps. We'd have it all figured out. You're not going to know enough until you know enough to have faith. And once you realize that it's faith and part of the struggle is having that faith and exercising that faith, then suddenly you've learned more than knowledge is ever going to give you. And today, you know, I'm hollering out, space bar, because Braden's just as tired as I am and, and, uh, and Macy's just as tired as her mama is. Maybe not. She didn't build as many things as we built or carry as many tables as we did. But I have been told it's hard to be that pretty, so I can see why she might be tired. But, <laughs> but when I thought about what does, a, what, does a, what does a pastor who has the privilege of officiating his own child's wedding, what does he learn and then share less than 24 hours later with his congregation? Well, one thing I learned yesterday was man, doing my daughter's wedding will be 10 times harder than yesterday. <laughs> Yet yesterday, I see some moms shaking their... Yesterday included me being with my son as I handed him to the responsibility I have been preparing him for. But when she asks me to do that, I have to be handing her to someone else. And I'm just going to let you in on a secret. God has not made a man I trust. He will be an anointed individual because when he breaks that wall is how I'll know, oh, okay, you're going to be all right. But see, she's even been told by friends of hers, Macy, you know why you don't get asked out all the time? Because your dad is scary. When she told me that, I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> because if they're so much of a coward that they're scared of me, then I know already they don't deserve you. But when I know I, I learned yesterday that when I have to hand her off, boy, that's going to be, that's going to be an even longer challenge than, than yesterday posed. But I also learned in getting ready for a wedding message, and I've had the privilege of officiating weddings plenty of times, but it's obviously different when the guy has my last name. And I wanted him to hear what I know he's heard his whole life. I wanted him to hear what I know he's seen his whole life because it's been my responsibility and his mother's responsibility to live out this biblical mandate before all three of their eyes, not only so that they could be raised in a healthy environment, but because they need to know what to expect for themselves. My daughter should not expect a lesser man than me. So then if that's my job, I better set a really high bar. And my son should not look for a woman of lesser quality than their mother. And so that's why her mo their mother should not set a low bar, but a high bar. Well, the trouble, though, is that if we're the ones defining the bar, we're both broken, fallen people. And we're going to look for a way to set the bar a little lower. Because if it's set too high, it's hard. And I, I need some ease in my life. So I need that bar to be set a little bit lower. You know, let me make it something easily achievable so I can pat myself on the back and say, look what a good job I did. Well, that's no good. 
And so instead, I have to go outside of me and you outside of you to have that bar set by someone above. That bar set by the one who created the rules and the morality by which we all live by anyway. See, if we all got to decide what was right and wrong, it would be a big mess. If you don't agree with that, I just invite you to look outside. I just invite you to watch the news or read the news, whichever one you prefer, and tell me, while people are running around the earth deciding what's right and wrong for themselves, does it look like it makes a lot of sense? We need the morality that God gives. We need that to come from outside of us. We're broken. So where does the morality for this relationship that older brother just entered into and younger brother and sister will one day be entering into, this relationship that I was blessed to be united with a woman who agreed, we'll just shoot for what God told us to shoot for. And we're going to stumble and trip and bloody our knees on the way, but we'll be going in the right direction. Well, where does that bar come from? And what does that bar say? And am I willing, before I ever read it, ever try to comprehend that God literally gives beautiful positions in marriage, before I ever even try to hear him Describe it. Am I willing to realize that whatever he's about to say will sound wrong to an earthly ear? Because the Bible says that the gospel, the good news of all of this is foolishness to the world. It sounds wrong to the world. It confounds the wisdom of men. So when I look to the Bible, you set the bar of what my relationship should look like with my spouse. And and if you're not If it's already come and gone so fast that you forgot, we had a marriage conference last week, you might remember. So so I'm also striking while the iron's hot. Tate, in that marriage conference, I felt like did a really good job of sharing some really good things. Today, I want to share with you what I would have shared in that conference. But see, I knew I'd get the chance today, so, so I didn't interrupt him. I didn't want people to say I'm more rude than they might already think, you know. But here in Ephesians chapter 5, I know most of you can read that, and I see some of you already going there. To me, for me, and for many, there is nowhere biblically that the bar is as clearly identified what does a man and a woman look like together in marriage as this spot right here. Now, I can't take this spot out of its context, though, and I'm going to show you why that matters in just a moment. But here is perhaps the most famous husband and wife passage in the Bible. But part of why it's famous is because it became a joke. It became an avenue of comedy because men wanted to read the part that applied to them in their benefit, so they thought, and then not read the rest. So they lost how the positions were intended to be beautiful because they wanted to taint one of those positions. But Paul is speaking about everyone's relationship with God when he uses for him in his day the three most significant relationships in civilization as an example of that. So he's talking about you and me, everybody in Ephesus, every believer who's ever going to be able to have the privilege of encountering the word of God. He's talking, the spirit is speaking to all of us about submitting ourselves to the Lord And then he drives that point home by showing how that should be reflected in the three most significant relationships of his day. Those three relationships are categories, husband and wife, parent and child. And this one, this one slightly rubs us a little wrong because of history and American history specifically, but slave and master. Now, I'm not going to talk about that part specifically, the slave and master, but, but just to In the future, if you'd like to go further in this, understand that servant or slave in Paul's day largely included what the full term is bond servant. And this isn't slave as in indentured servitude, I stole you from your home, I took you from your family, and now you work for me for the rest of your life. No, this was the kind of slavery where I owe a debt, so to pay it off, I'm going to come be your house servant. And these people were then bonded to this person in servitude to earn or work off a debt. So slavery to us, from an American mind, is anathema, to be forbidden in all ways. But slavery to Paul is a way of life. People make the choice to enter slavery, 
if we're going to use that term, but servitude, as a job, for lack of a better term. And so he's not, you, you, you would have seen this in his day as this is an extremely significant relationship that the master can trust and rely upon the servant to do what the master has either instructed or expected without words. And Jesus, over and over in his own teachings, uses the imagery of master and servant. Servants being at work when the master is away. The master coming home and finding the servant or the slave, is what the word literally translates, busy. The servants who are given gold and one guy invests it and doubles it, another guy invests it and doubles it, and another guy buries it in the ground. Those are slaves in that, in that story. So this is commonplace. So when you read through passages in the Bible about that, don't, don't let your American 21st century mind taint what the Bible is trying to say. Some people will use that to attack the Bible, to say, see, this is a backwater citizen, uh, culture, and we shouldn't read this or, or apply it. No, actually, you need to do a lot more work mentally to understand what's being said. This isn't backwards. Maybe you are. But that's not for today. Today is to look at the beautiful positions of husband and wife. But I say that confessing that I know this passage of Scripture has been made a joke. And I know that because people, men, husbands, have wanted to champion the instruction given to a wife and ignore what's given to a husband. But look with me, beginning in verse 22, chapter 5 of the book of, Ephesus, uh, book of Ephesians, written to the people of Ephesus. Paul begins in verse 22, and he says, Wives, subject yourselves, or submit, to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now see, we should stop there, pray, and go home. And then I can go home and look my wife in the face and say, do what I told you. Everything I told you, do it. And sadly, I say with sensitive speech because of the age of some people in this room, sadly, most men who struggle with this are going to apply that command to a specific behavior only, normally of the physical nature. Well, I want to call your attention first to needing context in all things. Verse 22, wives, depending on your translations, wives, submit yourselves, surrender to, that word is not there. There is no verb in that, ver in that verse. So you may have a, a modern translation. And when I say modern, I mean an English translation from the 21st century. Most of those will put subject yourself or submit in italics. So if you're using a translation like me, I have NASB 2020, submit yourselves for, women, for the wives is in italics. Well, why are they doing that? Because that's showing me there's no word there. Literally, if we were translating directly from Greek, and you always have to trust me when I tell you I did that already, I suffered through it. The, literally, the, word, the verse 22 says, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives what? Wives what to my husband? So to get the context, and it is submit, that is the context, i got to go back one sentence. i got to go to verse 21. Look at what Paul says in verse 21. Subject yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. You see, everybody is a submitter. Everybody. You see, verse 21. Submit yourselves, everybody, to Christ. Then he identifies those three categories, and so you see he doesn't need a verb. So it's like if we said, using 21 in context, everybody needs to submit themselves to Christ. Wives to your husbands. You see how he does that? So he's conversing with the Ephesians. But there's no verb here to hammer on or to jump on because I need it in the context of we're all called to be submitters. Now, in the relationship of husband and wife, there is a difference. And you cannot, you cannot walk away from the truth. So this is probably, by definition of the 21st century mind, anti-feminine, 
But we cannot annoy, or we cannot avoid that the Bible says a wife should submit to her husband. I would like for you to hear that word as this, yield authority. Wives, yield authority to your husband, just like you yield authority. Because the reason I would like for you to understand it as yield authority is because that's what the word means. It, it, we don't have a one-to-one -one word here. This word that's being translated for us from verse 21 as submit means to recognize order in relationships. To know that there's a level one person and then a level... You ever called needing help because your coffee maker quit working? And you're like, look, I keep pushing all these buttons and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make me coffee. And if it's not going to make me coffee, somebody gets choked in my house. And the person says, oh, I need, to, I need to put you to level two technical support. You ever done that before? Maybe not. If you've never done, if you've never had to call and talk to some technical support people who, who, who don't have English as their first language, you know, and, and, and you're like, I, I'm sorry, I can't understand what you're saying. That, that kind of experience, is, it's not very fun. Okay, well then, God bless you. May all of your technological devices always work completely until you no longer want them. But I used to work in IT. Before God called me to ministry, my hands were in computers all day. So I spent a lot of time specifically with people who worked at Dell Computers. You ever heard of them? And so we had to pass a test from the company Dell so that I didn't have to go through level one. See, I, I got to skip. I got a different telephone number from you regular people. And I got to go straight to level two. I got to skip a level of authority. Level one had only a certain level of authority. They could only talk me through some steps, but they couldn't approve me getting a replacement part. Level two had that authority. And so I got to skip there so that I could just say, I have a bad hard drive. I need a replacement. You and I recognize authority. If you get onions on your cheeseburger and you said you didn't want onions on your cheeseburger, you're going to throw that cheeseburger on the counter at McDonald's and say, let me see your, you know authority then. Let me see the person over you. That's what you're asking. Paul says, wives, Surrender to the authority of your husband. In other words, Paul says there is a level of authority in your home and he is at the top. So surrender to that. Surrender to his authority. But I want you to see how that surrender looks. He says it as to the Lord. So there's this huge moment to pause as a woman and see whether you are in the bounds of a marriage relationship, you one day hope and look forward to the bounds of a marriage relationship, you have been in those bounds before, and you stand as an advice giver or a helper to those. Now, some of you in here, you get friends who complain about their husbands to you, or friends who don't know how to fix a problem at home between their husband or their child, and they come to you for advice. All of us have impact into other people's marriages, so as a woman, when you think about what is my place in this marriage, I want you to recognize that your place in your marriage is a reflection of your relationship with your creator. Because he says you submit, you surrender to this authority of your husband just like you do to God. Now what are we instructed as believers to trust God with? Some stuff, most stuff, or everything? Paul is instructing every wife ever to live, you look to your husband to take care of everything. Trust him. Surrender to him taking care of everything. Immediately, every guy who's ever wanted to be like, yeah, you're supposed to submit to me. When you start understanding what it says, now all of a sudden every husband that I've ever gone through this with is like, hmm, that's a little heavy. What do you mean everything? Well, the Bible says everything. Because, see, a marriage relationship was created by God to reflect him and the relationship he has with his people. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2, when Adam recognizes that he is alone and God speaks for the first time in creative history, this is not good. He says, it's not good that Adam is alone. And so he takes Adam and he causes a deep sleep to fall upon him. And he takes a rib out of the man and uses that to fashion woman. And when Adam awakes from that, he sees this woman 
And only now has the earth ever seen a woman more beautiful than my wife. There's Eve and Becky. And I don't mean that as an insult to any woman in this room. I hope every husband would disagree and fight with me in the parking lot. Exactly. <laughs> the most perfect, unmarred by sin, unmarred by time, unmarred by stress, unmar just the most perfect example of a woman. And what does Adam do? Now, you might have read this before. At last, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. It's a song. When you look at that in Hebrew, it's written as a poetry form that we know would have been sung. Adam starts to sing. This woman is so beautiful. Now, fellas, have you ever seen her walk out? And she's got some kind of special dress on, or she did her hair, and you go, ooh, you're, you're doing what Adam was doing. <laughs> you're experiencing that moment. Now, some of you might thought, singing. I mean, who would, what kind of weirdo would do that? Well, you've done it. Woo, you whistle in her. You're doing that. Except Adam just committed to it. Now, I don't know. At last, this is flesh of my flesh. I don't know what the tune was like, okay? I don't know. Was he tap dancing, Fred Astaire, and down the steps in the, I don't know. I just know he was singing because this woman was so beautiful, it drew that out of him. And then the Bible says, the commentary of the moment. See, it's the Spirit using Moses to write this commentary. All of a sudden, as he's telling us about this creation moment, he says, for this reason. Now, this is explaining. Moses is saying, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and joins with the woman, and the two become one flesh. Well, again, we have people, <laughs> I know what that means. I know what it means, two people become one people. No, you don't if that's all you know, because that's not what that means. It does not mean that it, for this very reason a, a man leaves his mother and father and joins with the woman and the two have intercourse. That's not what that means. It means that there is a mystery in which two individual people become a single person in the eyes of creation. Because you cannot have me without her anymore. So inside of that beautiful mystery, Paul says, your function wife, you represent in your home, in that marriage. Do you know who you are? Do you know what part you play? You are the whole church. And the whole church submits to the authority of God. So wife, you submit to the authority of the husband. Paul says, just like or just as to the Lord. He continues that thought as the church is subject. See, he's explaining it for those of us who might be slower or thick-skulled. As the church is subject to Christ, also wives ought to be to husbands in everything. Now, here's where normally a sweet young woman would be like, well, I'll submit to some stuff. But look, well, whatever you're about to say, I do understand you have the right to have that opinion. But my Bible says everything everything. Now, every bad example that you can think of, of how this relationship can and has been abused, floods your mind when you hear that. The Bible says, wife, that you should submit to your husband in everything. You think immediately about that sweet woman you know whose husband controls who she hangs out with, who she can talk to, what time she has to come home, what she's allowed to watch on TV. What she, you think of every way that this relationship has been abused. Don't use wickedness to define what God has called good. Because the beauty of the wife's submission works hand in hand with the rest of this passage. See, from 22 to 33 is 12 verses. I know if you do the math, you get 11, but it's 12, I promise. Verse 33 is to both the man and the woman. He just really quick repeating what he says in verse 33. So if you take that one out, you've got 22 to 31. That's 11 verses. Three of them, three out of 11 apply to the woman. Eight out of the 11 apply to the man. Who do you think Paul is needing to pay more attention? But wives is not saying that because it's easy to submit. But in the scheme of responsibility, in the scheme of the weight of the world, 
Is it easier for me to trust God to handle it and to just watch him do what he does? Or is it easier for me to be held responsible for doing it on his behalf? Well, I got to go over here and fix this problem. I got to go here and handle this. And I got to go out there and fix that. And there's somebody over there that's going to need my help in about five minutes. And also there's three things I didn't get to today. And I got to, I got to finish that. And she's not going to eat if I don't make sure she has something to eat. And this little one's about to have an injury. And I'm going to have to take care of putting the people in place. I don't want to do all that. I just want to know and relax in the fact that God's got it under control. Submit to your husband the way you submit to God. Even in your marriage relationship, God is using that to teach you how you love and submit to him. Because you're not going to be able to submit to that husband that you made vows to if you can't submit to God first. Because let's be honest, <laughs> a marriage is like two rivers coming together. And the two rivers on their own can be as smooth of a current as possible. But if you take two smooth current rivers and you bring them together at one place where they come together, that water gets real rough real fast. We call those rapids. And it's not until a little further down that river that those rapids calm down and those two rivers have become one. Well, a lot of us spend all of our time where those rapids are and we never move. We wonder why. It's probably, maybe, because we're using the wrong bar to measure whether or not we know what we're doing. So Paul says to the wife, submit. And we could go on because our culture has tried to demonize and damage what that truly means to the point that if a woman says, oh, I fully submit to my husband and everything, the women around her go, girl, what is wrong with you? I'm not going to let no man tell all those things. Well, I can appreciate the opinion. I'm just going to let God be in charge. Fellas, let's look, though, a little further. Because like I said, most men want to stop at verse 24. And I want to call your attention before I ever get to it in verse 25, gentlemen. You will notice that he does not say, husband, command your wife. Husband, lead your wife. Husband, direct your wife. He doesn't say anything about take advantage of the submission. Notice what he does say. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water. With, oh, sorry, washing of, yeah, I said that right. <laughs> hey, look at me. Cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, which, by the way, is broken. See, you love yourself and you're sinful and broken. You don't hate your own flesh. You nourish it and cherish it just as Christ does the church because we are part of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoted Genesis 2.24 there. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects, and I hate that my translation does that, she respects her husband. Does anybody have a translation that uses the word fear? Does anybody's translation, just tell me, I'm just curious, anybody's translation say, and the wife see to it that she fears her husband? Because that's the word. Paul says, fear him. And it's even the word that we get, it's a Greek word that we get the English word phobia from. Now, do you think that means cower? Or does it mean revere? To respect the fact that he holds the authority. In the same way that the Bible tells us to fear. Go back for me, one page, well, if you have to, one page. Notice in verse 21. Subject yourselves to one another in the, what? Fear of Christ. You see, it's all connected. So husbands, let's deal with ourselves, shall we? Whether you are one, you want to be one, or you've been one and somebody needs your advice. Think about what he just said. Notice he didn't say lord yourself over her. He didn't say command everything from her. You don't tell her all of the things to do and not to do just so. It says love her. And when we look in the original language, if you don't know this, Greek... <clears throat> 
Greek has four words for love. One of them became so synonymous with filth that even Greeks wouldn't use it. So then we normally would say Greek language, Koinea Greek, the New Testament. It has three words for love. Eros. We get the English word erotic from this. This means romantic, desirous love. This is a love that brings me pleasure. Phileo, brotherhood. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Phileo means familial togetherness. We're in this together. And then there is agapo, or normally translated and transliterated as agape. Agapo, the closest English understanding. It's not, Greeks didn't like using this agapo because it looks self-defeating. It means to love you at my own cost. It means to love you not because of who you are or what you bring me, but because of what you mean to me. Every time in the New Testament that you find the Bible talking about God loving you, it uses the word agapo. Every time we, well, not every time, but quite often when we hear or see people in the New Testament trying to understand their love for God, it uses a different word. For example, when Peter, at the end of the gospel according to John, when he sees Jesus on the, on the seaside, I'm about to trip, and when he sees Jesus on the seaside and he jumps out of the boat and swims over there and they have breakfast and Jesus calls Peter aside, he says, Peter, tell me, do you love me? And if we were reading it in Greek, we would see that Jesus says, Peter, tell me, do you agapo me? And Peter responds, Master, you know I phileo you. You see? Peter can't answer correctly because he knows. He's not trying to lie to Jesus anymore. He lied when he said, I'm not going to deny you. He's already been busted. So he knows there's no point in trying to play. He says, Master, I, I, I know you're my father. I know, I know we're family. So a second time, Jesus says, Peter, do you agapo me? And Peter says, Master, you know I phileo you. Well, then Jesus speaks straight into his heart and says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter cries. You know everything. See, Peter is confessing, I'm, I blew it, didn't I? And you know, don't you? You heard me deny you. In fact, in one account of the gospel, it says that as soon as he denied Jesus that third time, he looks across the room, all of those people accusing Jesus falsely, all of them laying hands on him, spitting at him. And when he denies knowing that man for the third time, he looks up and Jesus is staring at him. Now, I bet, like me, you think that Jesus is looking at him like, I told you so. But instead, I choose to see that he would have been looking at Peter likely the same way he looked at Peter the day that Peter walked on water. Child, why did you, why did you be afraid of this? Why are you scared? Not with anger, but with pity for the broken nature of Peter's heart. And it says that Peter ran away weeping bitterly. Weeping. That's not like, that's, you know, runny nose type of crying. And so here Jesus has challenged Peter. And so he cries and says, you know everything, so I know that you know I'm telling you the truth. I love you, phileo. All three times all Jesus has said in response to him is, then go do what I told you. Now, is this a lesson where Jesus is trying to say, you don't love me enough so you can't do what I've asked? You don't love me enough so you can't be in my family? You don't love me enough? No, it's you're going to learn to love me different. But no matter how you love me now, go do what I've told you. So you take learning to love someone different and apply it to what Paul is saying here. This word that only ever applies to how God loves us and see that he says, husbands, that's how you love her. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, whatever it asks of you for her good, that is what you do. You love her. Now, I want you to consider what does the Bible say about Jesus 
in essence of what does it say that we don't want to think about. Does it say that Jesus was the best looking guy in the room? No. Isaiah says he wasn't much to look at. It wasn't any qualifying feature. He didn't stick out as a king. But what does Isaiah tell me? That he was a man of sorrow. Isaiah says, by his stripes, I am healed. Well, what's a stripe? That's a fancy, uncommon word. We don't use that anymore. We say, my dad spanked me on the back and I had stripes. We don't say that. So most translations, instead of saying by his stripes we are healed, will say by his wounds we are healed. So husband, hear what the Bible is telling you. Who takes the pain in the marriage relationship? You do, so that she doesn't. Why? Because your job is to reflect the love of Christ through your marriage that the world would then be drawn to the love that God has for his church, for his people. You see, a marriage exists to exemplify the truth of the gospel. That God loves me the way I'm trying, vainly, in vain, I suppose. I can't do it well. I'm doing my best. But the way that someone will see me love my wife is me trying to teach a lesson without words. This is God loving me. So if there's a weight to carry in my family, she should know that she's going to have me carrying it. If there's a need to be filled in our family, she should know to come to me to see it done. Does every guy love this? No. I, that stresses me out. I just want to watch the game with the boys. I just want to play. No, that's 20, it's 2024. I just want to play video games. It's my PlayStation time. No, it's not. You know, when Jesus is teaching and he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He is not inferring that everybody should walk around heaven with one eye. What he is trying to teach is that if it's causing a problem, be serious enough about it to get rid of the problem. So, fella, I love you to death. If the PlayStation is a problem, throw it away. And yes, I know how much you paid for it. If hunting is a problem, don't renew your license. If hanging out with the boys is an issue, stay home. Because you have been commanded by the creator of all things. Love her the way I love you. If her submission is teaching her how well she is submitted to God, then your love of her is teaching you how much you understand Jesus' love of you. How did Jesus love me? What did he withhold from me? What did he say this but not that to me about? The answer to those questions is nothing. So if I'm loving my wife the way he loves me, what do I withhold from her? What do I not give to her? What do I not provide for her? Every husband who wants to see the broken side of this says, well, all she ever asks me for is more money so she can go. You're going to yet again think of every broken way that this has ever been expressed to use it as an excuse for why we don't do what the Bible says. Don't use wrong to define God's right. You submit, wife, and you do well. You love as Christ loves, husband, and you do well. And when those two things happen together, you are introduced to something unstoppable that the world cannot destroy. And you are introduced then to the most significant power on defining the future of all generations. School teachers do a good job, but they don't define the generation. Mom and dad do. You think it's the public school's fault that kids don't know anything? I would tell you it's actually more on the shoulders of a fatherless home that they don't know what they ought to know. And then putting the trust in a teacher whose kid it is not. Who was instructed to teach children? Mom and dad. We offshored that responsibility to a teacher. So, what the, so I could play PlayStation. I need, my, I need my game time. Throw it away. Throw it out. I'm, I'm going to show you a quote. It's the biggest wall of text I've ever put up, but I couldn't not. I was by an early church father named John Chrysostom. But he was writing in, res, in relation to this disparaging 
difference between a wife struggling with the idea of submission, which is hard, I understand, but of, about a man missing what it's telling you when it says to love. Now, this is, I'm t- there are three slides worth of words. <laughs> and I, could, I was like, well, I'll take this part out. No. The only thing I've done to change this quote is I changed the thee, thou, hast stuff to modern English. So he's speaking to men, and he says, you have seen the measure of obedience. In other words, hey, guys, you see the level of commitment that the Bible says a wife should have to her husband. You see the measure of obedience. Submit to him in everything. Now hear also the measure of love. Do you wish for your wife to obey you as the church is to obey Christ? Then have a solicitude. When's the last time you used the word solicitude in a sentence? It means a caring Right? It, it means to care passionately about someone. Have a solicitude for her as Christ has for the church. And if it be necessary to give your life for her or to be cut in 10,000 pieces or to endure any other suffering, whatever, do not refuse it. And if you suffer thus, not even so do you do what Christ has done. For you indeed do so being already united to her, but he did so for one that treated him with aversion and hatred. See, Paul's saying, you want to be a good husband, just love the one that loves you. And Chrysostom is saying, and that's not even what Jesus did, because he loved the one that wouldn't love him. You're not doing, you're not, my job is just as hard as Jesus's was. No, it ain't. No, it's not. Don't do that. See what he's saying? Even if you're cutting 10,000 pieces, you haven't suffered the way he did. But he goes on. Boop. As therefore he brought to his feet and to understand the symbolism back then, being brought to someone's feet means being brought to submission or to surrender. As therefore he, that's Jesus, brought to his feet one that so treated him and that even wantonly spurned him by much tenderness of regard, not by threats, insults, and terror. So how did Jesus bring us to him? Not by, not by insulting us, not by cursing us, not by saying, you know, you act just like your mother. He didn't say that stuff. He loved us into submission. You see? Then he says, so also do you act towards your wife. And though you see her disdainful and wantonly wayward, because believe it or not, fellas, these women out here are thinking they are allowed to have opinions, you know, wanting jobs and voting and stuff. Which, some of y'all might not know me well enough to know I'm just being a smart aleck. Okay, I do allow my wife to vote. I just tell her who to vote for. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. But is it fair to say that in marriage, sometimes husband and wives disagree with one another? So that's what he means. Though you may see her disdainful and wantonly wary, maybe she decides you act too much like your own father and she don't want to talk to you. You need to sleep on the couch. Maybe we can't settle this argument in 10 minutes or less. And so you see her wantonly wayward. You will. Husband, whose job is he noting it's to solve this problem together? The wife needs to always be coming to the husband and trying to make peace? He says, Now, again, this is Chrysostom making an observation about the Bible, but you will be able to bring her. Husband, you're the one solving the problem. Just like Jesus solved our problem, you solve the marriage problem. You will be able to bring her to your feet, restoring her to that submissive moment by much thoughtfulness for her, by love, by kindness. Sometimes we think by comparing them to their mother or Comparing them to someone else's wife is somehow going to solve the problem that we've stumbled upon. I believe that might be highlighting our stupidity, but people try it all the time. He closes by this. No bond is more sovereign in binding than such bonds. You see, the highest of bonds is a soul to its creator. And the highest reflection of that is this marriage relationship. No bond is more binding than these bonds, especially in the case of husband and wife. For one may constrain a servant by fear. See, he's referring to that other relationship in Ephesians chapter 5. You may constrain a servant by fear, though not even he is so bound to you, for he may readily run away. But the companion of your life, the mother of your children, the basis of all your joy, you ought to bind to you not by fear and threats, but by love and attachment. You're not going to yell her into faithful submission, according to the Bible. You are going to love her there. I'm going to say that one more time. 
because sometimes we disagree. But you can disagree with me now, and I'll just tell you, you have the freedom to be wrong. Some people think you will yell and demand her into obedience and submission according to the Bible. You will not. You will love her there. I submit to Jesus because he loves me. The Bible says we love because he first loved us. I know I can trust him. I know I can rely on him. I know this. So it is then a pleasure to submit to him. Well, I'm not going to, by nature, just automatically have that relationship with my wife. For lack of knowing how to better put it, I'm going to earn that relationship with her. Some people say that it's not quite fair or right to put it like this, but I don't think I'm wrong. I don't ever speak and intentionally be wrong. I think it's extremely important to recognize that Jesus proved his love. He didn't just say it. Jesus didn't come down from heaven and say, guys, you have no idea how much I love you. I mean, I really love you. I love you more than the whole wide world. I love you this big. I love you to the moon and back. I love you inside and out, upside and down. I love you. See y'all later and go back to heaven. In fact, I want you to recognize that part of Jesus loving me and you was telling us something was wrong. Now, we already knew. We already knew that something was wrong. Mankind knows by nature that something is broken. Even nature itself knows. The Bible tells us that earth, the creation around us, is groaning to be restored back to the way things were before. But Jesus didn't hide the ball. He didn't say, hey, you're fine the way you are. To put it in 21st century words, Jesus came down and said, man, you are a hot mess. But I came to do something about it. And he didn't just talk about what he was going to do, husband. He didn't just say, oh, I'm going to be a real good savior for you. You're going to see tomorrow I'm going to take the garbage out. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm going to make the bed up. I'll have coffee. He didn't talk about what he was going to do. He went and did it. I don't wonder, did he actually love me? I have a cross and an empty tomb that say, yes, I do. In the same way a wife can rely on this relationship when she is shown this love that's described here in the Bible. Last thing I'd like to call your attention to, husband. Verse 28, I'm sorry, verse 26. Now this is speaking of Jesus to the church, to the body, but it's a reflection of a husband to a wife. It says that he might sanctify her, set her apart. That's what sanctify means, to be set apart. Your wife should know that she is unlike any other according to your definition. She should not assume she's in competition with anything. The PlayStation, the hunting stand, the boys' night, or any other attention grabbing. There is nothing. There's no, there's no, uh, I got a lot of, I got a lot of horse, I'm, horses scare the Holy Ghost right out of me, okay? I don't, they're too big and they're too unwieldy, okay? But like Ashley and Quay and, you know, they're the horse people. I got horse people. The horses freak me out. But you know, horse, I'm going to ride a horse. I'm going to go to a rodeo. I'm going to do this. Not at the cost of your marriage. If you're spending more money on black beauty than you are spending on your earthly beauty, you are doing something wrong. And somebody needs to tell you that. And if you have to be mad at me for saying so, then all I can offer you is I'm just quoting the Bible. Because the Bible tells you, husband, sanctify her. Set her apart from everything else. It doesn't say not to have hobbies. It doesn't say not to go hunting or to play PlayStation. It doesn't say you can't do that stuff. But she is above it all. She has a worth far beyond rubies. There is no diamond on earth that can amount to her value. There isn't a price tag long enough or enough ink to print on it the dollar value of this wife that God gave to me. Out of the billions of women on this earth, he fashioned and shaped 
her? For me, I have been given the most unique gift on this planet, and she exists with me and for me, and when we are called to heaven, she will never exist here again. How could I ever think the right way to treat her is to go hang out with my homies while she cries at home? I mean, she'll get over it. I would argue that the divorce rate says she might not. Sanctify her means to set her apart from everything. And then he says that Jesus has purified his bride. Purified her. It says it like this. Cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now we could spend, I got a friend here. I got a seminary student judging every word I'm saying this morning. He's my friend and I am happy to watch him grow and be stronger and wiser and greater than I'll ever imagine have been. So he might know that there's an argument throughout history of what that means to cleanse her by the washing of water with the word. Does that mean baptism? Does that mean that Paul is saying, like Jesus has baptized the church, is he telling me I need to baptize my... Some people argue that this is a symbol of baptism. I would argue to you not. And I would use what Jesus says to the disciples in John chapter 15 as evidence. Because here in John 15, verse 3, Jesus says to them, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. This is a clean on the inside type of clean. This isn't some outwardly Becky is more attractive because I speak kindness to her, although I do think there's scientific evidence for that. Because when somebody's speaking joy over you, you smile more, and smiling people just look better. I think that Biblically, what it's saying here, because it goes on that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle. Jesus purifies me by telling me the truth. By saying, child, do you know what you are? Do you know what you mean to me? Watch, let me show you. In the same way, my wife should know and believe and trust and have examples of how I will speak over her and wash her heart with the words I say. She will know that she is beautiful because she will hear me tell it to her every single day. She will know every wedding that we ever attend, including my sons, and sorry, Macy, but even when my daughter gets married, I tell her the same thing every time, not because it's a joke or I'm lying, but because it's true and I don't want her to forget. So yesterday, my son is getting married, and we're old enough to have a daughter-in-law. And there my daughter-in-law stands, and she's a very beautiful young woman. My son has got good eyesight. But I told my wife, you did it again. I almost think it's not fair, honey. But the rule is no one's supposed to be prettier than the bride, but I guess you can't help it. Does she know that I think she's beautiful? Yeah. And she doesn't have to know that because she reads my Facebook posts or she overhears what I said to the dudes at work. I will look her in the eyes and I will tell her there are plenty of good women in the world, but none are like you. None. And see, the more I tell her what I know in my heart to be true, there are no wrinkles and spots. She sees them. She'll be like, look at my eyes. I don't know what that is. What is she complaining about? Something about, I don't even know. Or she'll be like, oh, she's always talking about something. I'm like, how do you complain about perfection? That's got to work really hard. But the more I'm able to name out loud what I've been given, the more I'm actually learning to see the world the way God does. Is God aware of my sin? Sure is. Does he see it? Well, the Old Testament says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed my transgression from me. And so I'd ask you, how far away is east from west? It never stops going one direction and another. Though he knows all things, he chooses not to recount my transgressions. Almost then that when I go to him and say, Father, you know, five years ago, I, 
I know we've talked about this before, but five years ago when I did, it's almost as though the Bible is trying to help me understand that God says, son, I'll listen to you, but I'm not sure I know what we're talking about anymore. Because he doesn't hold it against me. Ladies, you, you think we're paying attention. Crow's feet, that's what it's called. What even is that? You think I'm paying attention to that? I'm not. My daughter says she has funny legs. What does that mean? It's the second most beautiful creation God has ever formed on this earth, this young lady, and all she can tell me is she has funny legs. Gentlemen, what if you accepted the responsibility of knowing that exactly what your wife believes about herself comes out of your mouth? That you purify her and wash her with the words you speak? What if we knew that that's what marriage was before we ever stood and took vows together? What if we were willing to bear the weight of this? How exactly am I being called to love this woman? to bear every burden ever to come that she might always know she is holy and blameless, loving her like I love myself, a reflection on the golden rule to treat others the way you would have them treat you. And he ends this before moving to children and parents, which is a whole another sermon that might get you a behaving kid for five minutes, but he ends this section and says, nevertheless, why nevertheless? Because he says, I know this is a mystery. I know it's hard to comprehend this idea that two become one, but more hard to comprehend is that we all become one with Christ. But nevertheless, understand it or not, husbands, love her the way you love yourself. And wives, submit to him, fear him, revere that he holds that authority in this home, in this family, in this life that the two of you have been given the opportunity to create, becoming one in the sight of God. Tanner and my daughter-in-law Maddie will not do this perfectly. Statistically, early on, they won't even do it well. But would you like to know something else they won't do it with? They won't do it Perfect. They probably won't do it well at first. But as God is my witness, I'll tell you something you might already know. They will also not do it alone. They will not be asked to figure it out. They have the same instruction book that I have. And I'm familiar with what the words are. So I'll be there with my wife, helping my son with his, every chance they need it, and ask for it. And you know, what, you know what she'll be told? Don't call and complain about your husband to your mama. You know what he'll be told? Do not badmouth your wife to your workmates. Do not treat like trash that which is treasure. Wife, it is commanded to you. If it bothers you, I do understand. Ask God for help. Ask him to teach you how to surrender to him more through the exercise of trusting the surrender you are called to it as a wife. And husbands, because I am one, I wear this weight a little more. Understand what it means to love her. It doesn't mean fondness. It doesn't mean still be stricken by her beauty. All of those things are important. It means sacrifice for her good at your loss in all things. And in doing so, understand at a deeper level how much Jesus loves you. As you learn that, you teach that. As she submits to that, she accepts that. And then we learn exactly how we fit into the plan of God. This is why the Bible says that God loves marriage and hates when it falls apart because it is a reflection of him and us 
forever. And that begins, though, by all of us having received this set freeness that Jesus gives us through the cross. You cannot be a faithful, submissive wife and not already know Jesus. You got to start there. You cannot be a loving husband and not know the love of Jesus. So everyone in this room has something to reflect on. Who you are as a spouse, who you want God enabling you to be as a spouse, who you can be as a point of wisdom, who is a spouse, or whether or not you even know him at all, the one who sets these bars for us, this morality maker. He has all of us the best of interests in the depth of his heart. Are we willing to receive that? Let's pray. Almighty God, I, I will never know how to rightly thank you for my salvation. That you would look upon the garbage, the trash of a lost man like me. And then with such audacity to say that's worth dying for. But in the same way, Lord, I do not know and nor will I ever know how to thank you for the wife that you bestowed upon me and the family that you enabled us to shepherd over. Today I stand here with a flock smaller by one only because he has left this field to farm in his own. And this is the beautiful fulfillment of your plan. But it could not have been done without the woman that you joined me with. And then to be allowed to learn that through that union, I would learn more than I knew I could learn about being joined with you forever. All of this because you say so. And for that I am grateful. I pray now as we avail ourselves of a time to reflect and think on the things you have spoken over our hearts that we would be most of all sensitive to hearing you speak. And then that you might pour upon us the power to do that which you command, to be that which you have ordained, and to testify to the truth you have spoken over all of creation. All of this is because of love, so for that we thank you the most, that we would know love because you loved us first but that we in turn could pour that same love over everyone we come in contact with. You alone are good. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen.